remembrance what we've already spoke about. Father, we thank you that we're building upon principles that you've established in your word. Father, we thank you that uh, we have ears that are very attentive and open. Father, I ask you to speak beyond the words that I speak. Speak into their heart. And we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jude is exciting. It's a great book to study. Who's read it? You guys read it in between a little bit? Uh, you should be able to read that one pretty quick and read it several times, which is really good. Uh, and it was a very real threat at the church when uh, Jude was writing. Uh, so let me just do a review. So Jude's audience was a bit confused because it said that the apostles went in and taught uh, this particular group of people, but then there was another group of people that came in, right? And they were actually uh, teaching a different doctrine. You guys okay? Yes. You guys are awfully quiet. That's okay. So uh, we'll get going. So uh, what was interesting, they didn't know exactly who was telling the truth. And one thing that we had up here the first two, two weeks, we won't have it now, but we had a thing called a plumb line. And that's just the basis of the word. And uh, so they were hearing things from these apostates that came in. It sounded pretty good. I don't know if you've ever heard word that sounded really close to what the Bible says, but it wasn't exactly accurate, but it sure did sound good. And that's t a little bit what they were talking about. It's not the same teaching, but it feels pretty good. He said, we were taught by apostles, but it feels good. Uh, they were feeling pressure from culture. Do you ever feel that now? The things that we believe and hold fast to, uh, I've met with people and they say, well, that, that's really not a very tolerant doctrine that you serve. And I said, well, I didn't, I didn't know I needed to be tolerant, but uh, it was a different teaching. They felt pressure from culture, people in government, and they were swayed by popular opinion. I have a believing that these people that were apostates that came in, they were charismatic. They were good looking. I mean, they came in when the room shone. When they came in, they go, oh, God did good. That's a good looking man. Or that's good looking. So they had attention immediately. Jude was equipping, equipping them to stay true to original doctrine. And here's what it is for us as believers to stay true to original doctrine. Uh, we have to have something that will keep us true. And that's the word. Uh, so uh, we talked about establishing a consistent plumb line. And then does anybody remember the scripture? Bonus points. If you remember the scripture that I said was even in the Bible about a plumb line. You're close. I see the look in your face. It's some, we don't even go there hardly. Amos? That's right. Okay, Amos. We'll work together on this. It could be really good. It's a number between one and eight. One and eight. Seven. So, so good. So good. You guys are just Bible students all day long. Seven and eight. I'll read it. It says, uh, thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, and he said to Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not pass by them anymore. What he was saying is he said, it's very difficult to see if something's perfectly straight unless you have what they call a plumb line that you can go against. I also mentioned that what apostate meant. Uh, I won't say bonus points for this one because you'd have to really wrote this down. Uh, to refuse to continue to follow, obey, or recognize a religious faith, doctrine, or original teaching. So that's what we're talking about. Uh, now, I told you that if you could remember these groups of three, you could remember the book of Jude. So... Uh, we're going to go through those real quick, and if anybody can say from verse 1 what the first three were, we're, we're, we're a good way there. What was the first three? Called, sanctified, preserved. Excellent, guys. And then in verse 2, he said three more things. What did he say? Mercy, peace, love. Oh, man, I tell you. Hey, I'm going to give you guys a little cheat sheet here. If you'll open up your Bibles right now. And you'll get your word out. You know what's really going to happen? You don't have to give me this look like... And, and the truth of it is, when you look down, I still know that I'm seeing you. You know, I know that means don't pick me, but get your Bible out. This is such a great thing. Uh, I'll go, so I forget it. How about the next one? There was another group of three that he talked about in the Word. I'm not going to give you the verse, but I'll tell you it's between verse 1 and verse 7. You should be able to find it. It starts with Israel, angels, angels Oh my gosh, you guys are on a roll. That's really good. And then we went through the three characters I loved, which was Cain, Balaam, and what was the last one? Korah. 
groups of three. If you can remember this, you can go through it. What we're going to talk about today is the five metaphors that starts in verse 11 and 12. So in, it's mainly in verse 12. So we're going to go through those today, and uh, it's going to be a good thing. Uh, something that I'll, I just feel prompted, I'll tell you now before we get to the, but it's way at the end. Wow, Lord. I'm curious. If you only read your word, I'm going to be, and just so you know, uh, this is not necessarily a rah-rah, but it's important message for you. So here's what's amazing. Uh, if you get 90 minutes on a Sunday, 52 weeks a year, how many hours of the word do you get in a year? <laughs> what did someone say? <laughs> 78 hours. There is... 8,760 hours in a year, so that's less than 1% of a year's attention. So what we're going to talk about, in order to have that plumb line, we're going to believe that we're going to bring it up to at least 10%. And 10% is this, and this is really easy, 10% would be what of 876? 8,760. Just drop the zero off. 876. Very good. And that is actually 37 days in a year out of 300 and how many in a year? 365. All we're asking to get to 10% is 37 days. You can skip all the rest. Not true. But I wanted to give you some insight that what we're talking about, in order to have this kind of plumb line we're talking about, believers need to ante up. Mm. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's go with verse 12. You ready? It says, these are spots in your love feast. So while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. So what he's doing, a metaphor, basically, he's giving a principle by using another analogy. So uh, picture this. We have this all the time as believers. We have either pop blessings or we have family dinner. And this is what they would do. In Acts 2.42, they often talked about that they fellowshiped together. They went to the temple under the apostles' doctrine. They fellowshiped, they dined, and they prayed together. This was commonplace. Uh, and I would say that, so it's a pop blessing. They were eating, uh, uh, no, for the love, lots of information. So uh, anyway, it was a pop blessing, and here's what the apostates were coming in. I wish I could call them art or something like that instead of the apostate. We'll just call them art. But what was interesting is that when they came in to the, the festival or the feast, they were first in line. So what, if you study this out, what you'll find is that many of the people at that festival or feast, they called it a feast of love, had not eaten in quite some time. That one meal for that Sunday was going to be just a supernatural meal because everybody brought their supply. Someone brought ham. Someone brought, uh, for my wife, they brought um, maybe some very healthy pine cones and stuff like that. And uh, it works, she eats very well. So anyway, so uh, they would eat first, leaving nothing for the others. And, uh, and it says in this that they are stones in the love feast. And that's a nautical term. Stones means hidden reef. So basically, on the surface, they looked really, really good. But the closer you got to them, that there was an undertow to those people. And it says that they were a hidden reef uh, or they were a jagged rock. And uh, he's starting to paint a picture to you. What does an apostate look, what can you look for uh, with that? And I thought of it this way. Uh, if you've got your phones, you don't have to give them out. But these would be the people, and don't take this too literally, that are selfie motivated. Yeah. <laughs> Their camera's definitely facing this way more than it's taking pictures of everybody else. So on their Instagram, they probably got a thousand pictures of themselves and maybe three of someone else. Or all their pictures include them in the middle with everybody else around. Uh, they're motivated by self. Everything is self-motivation. And uh, the second metaphor that he talks about is they are clouds without water, and they carry about by the wind. And I thought, this is kind of interesting. For me, this is how the Lord said, have you ever went to one of the car washes here, the full service? 
So you pay your money and you go around the little turnstile and the people wave you in and then they tell you to pull up till you get the red light and you pull up to the red light and then you assume something's going to happen. What are you going to assume is going to happen? Car's going to get washed. So you sit there and all of a sudden the machine goes down your side and the machine comes back. And the machine goes back down your side and then it comes back. But there's no water or anything coming out. What would your response be? Okay, what would your Christian response be? What's happening? What's happening? I, there's supposed to be water. They sold me something that's not actually happening. And what uh, Jude is talking about here, it's like that with clouds. And we've had some good storms lately. I go outside and we see these really black clouds. And we assume what's coming? Rain. Rain. We assume that's going to happen. And uh, it's interesting. And then we could also say, if the rain didn't come from a rain cloud, I thought it was going to rain. So what Jude is saying is that uh, Art, the apostates, I'll say that a couple more times so I can just say Art. What was interesting, he was saying, they're like clouds with no rain. They're like a spiritual person with no move of the Holy Spirit. They have no gifts moving in their life, but they sure do look good. They quote appropriate scripture, but they have no depth in their life. Uh, appearance of life-giving rain, but empty when pressed. And I don't know if you've ever came across someone that looks phenomenal from a distance, but they have no depth in the word. Uh, no condemnation with that. I mean, it's just the reality. Uh, and check this out. When it comes to art, the apostate, uh, their direction was determined by self-motivation. It says... They were clouds without water carried about by the wind. I don't know about you, but I can't control the wind. It just goes wherever it wants to go. So what it says about them is that they fly in and they fly out with no godly anointed objective. They just are self-serving. So they go to wherever it's self-serving. The next one, if you're writing these down, is it says it's late autumn trees without fruit. So Jude is saying, I'm giving you a picture to beware, uh, to be weary when people come into your midst. And, uh, and they're this, they're late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. So what he's saying is all of a sudden, if you went to Eckert's, and man, they got monster apple trees there. And it's season for apple picking. What would you expect to be there? What would happen if you walked up and Eckert says, Everybody, come on down. We got apples galore. You go down and there's not one apple. you get confused. And that's what the people that Jude was talking about. Because they were saying this. Would have expectations to have fruit because of their outward appearance. But they were void of any fruit in their life. Uh, you would be expected to have fruit uh, because of your reputation. And it's interesting that we should be able to, we don't judge people, but we can judge the fruit in their life. And if Jude was saying, if you're a fruit inspector, you'd find no fruit with these people. No fruit. Uh, how about this? This next one is uh, raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame. And I thought, what is that all about? Uh, we think the ocean is beautiful. Who loves Florida? Man, we go sit on the beach. Uh, you're just like me. You should have saw me. Last time I went to Florida, I had long pants on, a big floppy hat, long sleeves. I had the white. I don't like the beach at all. I don't like sand all over. We're playing in the sand, and sand goes everywhere. I don't know how it does that. It goes everywhere. It's ridiculous. See, but he, he's giving things that they would have understood because they had orchards he can talk about expected fruit. Because they had an ocean or a sea, he's relating to it raging waves of the sea. We think the ocean is beautiful, but in Jude's time it was feared. It was different. It was something to battle against uh, because of the waves and the storms. If you were a fisherman and you knew that there was a tempest coming, but you had to go out and feed your family, it was not a time of assured, being assured. It was difficult. 
uh, raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame. And what the foaming up their own shame talks about the words that they speak. Because here's what's interesting about Art the Apostate. When he comes in, he'll have words that are shiny, words that manipulate, but they don't emulate the goodness of God. Whoa. The next one is Wandering Star. And uh, I could have read the whole passage to you, but you guys can get this. You can read it. Uh, it says that it was a wandering star. Listen, it's not fixed in place, but travels or wanders determining their own purpose and plan. I'm going to go somewhere with this, but I see this a lot in the Christian church where they go from one church to the next church to the next church to the next church. They're not being led by Father God telling him to go to a location, they're being led by material things. Or they'll be led, I've heard it a million times, I'm just not being fed here, brother. That's not my role to feed you. My role is to present the word, you feed yourself. The, the challenge is that I hear all the time, well, the worship just isn't my kind of worship. I can, I've been in churches with no instruments. I know we don't have any instruments, but we have the tracks. And God still dropped like a rock. I've been in churches with a single guy and one guitar, and God moves like crazy. It's all the position of your heart. Hmm. The last of that section says, For whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever? Now, I'm not going to go through verse 14 and 15. I'm going to do something else. But 14 and 15 talks about Enoch. And Enoch in that passage says that there'll be 10,000 angels that come with the Lord and they will judge the apostate and he will be cast into hell and he will be uh, judged for his sin. Uh, I'm not going to go the whole thing, but Enoch actually in that uses a passage out of the book of Enoch, which you can study this out, do a little homework. The book of Enoch is not in our canonized Bible. Uh, but he was using it at the time because the people of that era knew of that book. They, they knew what he was talking about. And in fact, when you study it out in verse 14, it doesn't say 10,000 angels. It says 100,000 angels in the book of Enoch. He changed it. The other thing I'll tell you about the book of Jude, I, th I think Jude and Peter got together at Starbucks. <laughs> because if you look at Second Peter, it... It is very close to Jude, if you read it out. And they don't really know who wrote, who was first. I mean, Jude could have wrote it first, and Peter said, I'm going to plagiarize. Or Peter wrote it first, and, but he might have said, we were talking in the back, he might have said this, you can have some of my notes, but don't write it verbatim. If you read it together, it almost looks like they were sitting side by side and they wrote it. But for me, because the Holy Spirit, directed individual writers, that's even more fascinating to me, that they both got the same context. So good. So good. So who is Jude describing? Apostate. This is a person that doesn't adhere to his first faith or doctrine or belief. Uh, apostate, uh, for what we know reading, they're self-serving. They're focused on themselves before others. They've walked away from the original faith or doctrine. And I want to say this, and I'm just going to go through those metaphors one more time. They are spots in your love feast. They bring three things. They bring deception. They bring division. And they bring destruction. Can I give you a practical application of that? Yes. Complainers and murmurers. In the church, our church, every church right now. So I'm going to build a bridge here that we believe that Jude's talking about someone that happened back then. I believe he's talking about the church right now. And I'm going to walk through it. So it could be just like there are spots in your love feast. So they come to my family dinner that we have here. But the undercurrent is they're speaking against leadership. Or the undercurrent are talking about, I don't like that worship. I didn't like the songs today. I tell you what, the word didn't strike me. Maybe he didn't do enough studying today for me. So all of a sudden, did you see those people that came in in the back, how they were dressed? And all of a sudden, it takes a new look for me that they are spots in the current church right now. So it's easy to say, Jude is saying, he's talking about those apostates. 
But what if he's talking about us as the church right now? Could that be? I mean, I asked the Lord about this, and he goes, yeah, that, that's, I said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll go down this chain of thought. And then he said, how about late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulling up by the roots? And the Lord said, this is the Christian Christ follower. It's been a believer for 40 years, and they never had one convert in their life. Do you realize that 95% of all believers have never personally led someone to the Lord? 95% have never done that. Statistically, 67% of all believers never invite anybody to a church function. Never. Less than 1.7% of believers read their Bible weekly. 1.7%. So what is that? Flip it the other way. Help me. 98.3? Don't read their Bible weekly. And we wonder why we have no power in the church. This all stemmed from, man, I have been really crying out to the Lord that I look around, we only have 56 chairs in here. I said, how can it possibly be that we're not packed? Now, let's throw aside that I'm not the most riveting. I'll get that. I'll say that our worship isn't the, do we serve a fantastic God? Does he still heal people today? Does he still give hope? Then why aren't we telling other people about him? I'm hoping this is real pointed to us because here's the challenge. As pastor of a church, I can't do it on my own. And guys, I churn. I pray about this. It bothers me. Uh, It breaks my heart that I look at people. And I'm going to give you an analogy at the end. But uh, Christ followers for years, but your life doesn't reflect any gospel fruit. You got a great job. I believe, and and I'm going to be meddling a little bit as I go through, you give more performance to your boss than you give to Father God. You're more on time with your job than you'll ever be at church because it's just church. I've done it all my life. Uh, You will study for an exam or you'll study for something at work, but you will not pick up your word. And at the end of a life, I hope I hear this, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't want to hear the opposite, that you dedicated 87 hours a year to me, 90 minutes on a Sunday, but you expected me to move mighty through you. So this is what the Lord said to me, can you put away Netflix? I said, yeah, I can do that. So (laughs) I have systematically started canceling all my subscriptions, which not only saves me money, but it starts limiting Where my time? And this is what the Lord's been working with me. Uh, I'd like to go to a movie. Josh does this, talks to the Lord. I'd like to go to, he goes, you can go to a movie. It's permissible. But what I have for you as an offering beyond is part of the anointing call that you have. Would you rather have the movie or give me two hours and I'll show you the path for the next month? And and when you're first walking this out, you're going, I don't know. I think I'd like to have the movie for two hours, to be honest. But what if God did this? What if he made this promise to you that if you'll dedicate time to him, that he'll come sit right next to you and he'll reveal mysteries out of the word? Oh, that's weird because he actually has done that. He said, if you'll spend time with me, he will reveal mysteries. Uh, Evangelism. I love this. This is out of late autumn trees without fruit. Evangelism, it's just not really my thing, Pastor. We're going street witnessing. You want to you wanna clear a room? Just mention that one. Hey, I tell you what, we're going down on 159 by White Castles, and we're going to start witnessing. On the street? Yes, we're going to go on the street about Jesus? Yes. Pastor, let me, I got to pray about that, and I think I'm busy before I even know the date you give me. I think that's happened. I hear people all the time, well, that really isn't my gifting. Yeah, it is. I'll guarantee it's your gifting. Now, you may not go on the street and do it, because can I be very honest with you? That takes a holy boldness. When I did that in Ireland, I did it, but man, I was kicking and screaming while I was doing it, and I said, Father, guys are comfortable. And he said, well, just get into it. He said, what's the worst they can say to you? Yeah. The worst thing you do is shoot me. That's the worst <laughs> thing they can do. And he said, no. He said, the worst thing you can say is no. Yeah. 
But they didn't do that. Oddly enough, you did a phenomenal job. Lindsay did a phenomenal job. And so we were giving a flyer away for a meeting that night. And I thought, I'm going to be negative here. And I said, how many people are going to possibly? She had a lot of people come to the meeting that night. And I thought, get out of town. You know, this evangelism thing works. So good. How about this? They are clouds without water, carried about by the wind. Oh, here we go. I got lots on this one. So this is good. You guys got your Bible? Turn to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2.15. I'm going to read out of the Amplified. I'm going to read out of the Amplified. So what we're really looking at is what would be the opposite of an apostate? How would, what would that look like as a believer? And it says, this, Study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God approved. And it says, Testing by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, which is rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. So does this mean I have the capability to be skillfully teaching the word? Yes. Can you do me a favor? Would you quit telling yourself, I just don't know enough word? You know what? You know more word right now than a lot of countries know. People, I, I have talked to pastors that have no formal biblical education whatsoever. They just know what they've read in the word. So it says to me that you have the capability. Check this out. It says uh, right here, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed. You have no cause to be ashamed. You can correctly analyze and accurately divide. Listen, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of the Lord. And people say, what do you know about the Bible? I know that I'm, I can accurately teach and I can be skillfully uh, in dealing with the word. How about this Hebrews 10.25? I'm reading it out of the CEV. Hebrews 10.25, it says, Some people have given up the habit of meeting for worship. But we must not do that. We should keep on encouraging each other, especially since you know that the day of the Lord's coming is getting closer. What is that scripture basically saying? As believers, we need to get together. Do you know church is so optional now? I get more messages. Pastor, I'm doing this today. Thank you for letting me know. I, I have grappled within myself. I grew up in the 60s, 70s. And I think I was part of the 70s charismatic movement. And the door was open. I was there. I governed my life based on what my, my um, anointed call of God was and what the church was doing. And I realized uh, no condemnation to anybody else. But it's so important that we make church a priority. Why? Not for you. It's for someone else that comes in and you've walked through something. And then all of a sudden you come in contact and they say, listen, I'm struggling with this. And you go... I walked through that. Yeah. It's not that so much you come to get something. It's come to bring a supply. It's so important. So I want to challenge you. When an opportunity comes up on Sunday, Sunday fun day, I want you to think of a couple things. I can do that or I can bring my anointing to church. I'm going to give you a whole bunch of them. Gosh. I'm meddling right now. Birthdays, family reunions, going to an amusement park, every sport, I mean, under the sun. I want to challenge you. At the end of the day, what would Father God say? You can do that. That's permissible. I'm not, I don't want to be critical of that. I'm just saying for me, I've made the choice that Sunday is a day that I've set aside. It's not even an option. For me. For you, you can be whatever. But when people say, hey, I've got this great thing happening on Sunday. Can't do it. Well, why not? Because Sunday is set aside for my gift to give to someone else. It, it's not for them. And I just, for really strong believers, and uh, the reason I'm struggling a little bit, there's so much more I need to get into, and it, it's just... Um, me and the Lord's having a talk in my mind right now. So it's what's happening. So the challenge for me is that how do we get back to the point that uh, getting together as believers is as important? How do we get there again? Is it even possible in this culture? 
Is it relevant for now? Is it even needed? I've almost stopped online because we have two people watch. It's a lot of effort. If you want to watch it, go to the website. That's fine. But the reason the church was really brought together is it was to strengthen the believer. So when you were walking through something, you'd have other believers to come beside you, love on you. If you needed financial, something that, that, that you come and you share it with them, and then I don't care if they sell cars, they get that to you. Yeah. We've made it now where it's more self-motivated. If I come and I get something out of it, well, that's cool. I'll come back. But I don't think it was designed for that. And here's what I'll say is that come prayed up, come studied up. I'll keep going. Here we go. Acts 2.42 says this, and this was uh, one of our foundational scriptures when we started the church. They spent their time learning from the apostles. What did they spend their time doing? Yeah. I spent their, let's see, I spent their time kayaking on the river. There's nothing wrong with vacation. There's nothing wrong, but when it gets out of balance. All I'm saying is that while you're kayaking, Read your word that morning. Man, spend some time with God. Go have fun. Yeah. I'm not saying don't have fun. I love to fish. And I got to fish a couple days ago, which was really fun. I caught a ton of fish. It was just me in a boat on that lake, and I'm talking to myself how amazing fishing is. Did you see that fish? I saw that fish. I caught that fish. It was amazing. <laughs> uh, but what I did do that morning is I, I spent time with Father God, and I found out the plan. And I said this, if there's anybody else in that area that I need to speak to about you, you bring him in my path. Well, I had the whole lake to myself, so I assumed that wasn't the plan for that day. <laughs> and guys, I love you. I'm not being critical with it, but I do want to shake it up a little bit to say, is Sunday just a byproduct now? If you make it, you make it. If you don't, you don't. It's no big deal. Uh, it says, so they spent their time learning from the apostles, and they were like what? Family. Family. When's the last time you've called someone in this church just to see how they're doing? How about this? This is a scary one. To ask them out to dinner. What's doing? Tell you what. I noticed on Facebook that you posted something. Facebook's so easy, guys. Come on. Heart. Emoji. <laughs> like. Heart. Emoji. Like. While they're losing hope. They don't want to go on. But we do give them a bunch of hearts. It's not what the church was about. I wish on one part we didn't have technology. Because you know what it would be like when we just had rotary phones. Man, if I wanted to talk to my friends, what did I do? Man, I ran. I'm running down. The, well, I didn't get to talk on the phone. We had a party line. You probably don't even remember those where you do the ring ring. You have multiple rings on the same line. I'm dating myself now. All of a sudden, yeah, we had a rotary phone, but your ring was different than the ringer down the street. So you hear ring ring, you pick it up. And if your neighbor wanted to listen to it, they just pick up too. And you say, get off the phone. It's a private call. Anyway, we didn't have that long. But if I wanted to spend time with my friends, I had to be deliberate. And I'd run down the street and I'd bang on their door. Hey, you want to go out and play? We played G.I. Joe's, went around the world a million times. It was fantastic. I won't belabor that. <laughs> oh, God's good. Oh, I get so much more. What percentage of your day, month, or year is dedicated to the Lord? I'm just asking hypothetical. What part of that day so you can evaluate it's fantastic. We all may be fantastic in here. You may read your word every day, everything. I might be speaking to the choir. Uh, not sure. Matthew 28, 19. You guys all know the Great Commission. Go to the people of all nations and make them my disciple. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold... I am with you all the days. And it says perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion to the very close and consummation of the age. I read it out of the Amplified. I mentioned to you what breaks my heart. What breaks my heart is that we have people that are looking for hope. They're starving for significance. They're wanting to know that their life means something, but we are vessels that have no substance. And what we give is opinion, not the word. 
Now, guys, I've walked this. I'm not telling you anything that I haven't faced, uh, that life has just gotten away from me, where I'm working 70, 80 hours a week. I did that for a long time because I had put myself in a financial uh, level that required me to work a lot more. Uh, so it's no condemnation. I see it on social media every day. Uh, there's one person on, that I follow on Facebook, and he writes statements. Uh, it's just amazing. The world would be better off without me. How can you write that? So instead of giving a Facebook, which everybody gives a wonderful Facebook, I just call. I haven't got a call back, but I'll continue to call because I want to reach out to him. I'll end with just a couple statements. When believers come into the church, they often find this, often, not always, anemic people in regards to the word, anemic. And anemic means this, lacking substance or inequality at all, anemic. So if you tell them the story, hey, do you remember the story of David? Yeah, oh, I remember that story. And they can paraphrase it, but when it comes for people coming outside of the church, come in, they want substance. Tell me how it changed your life. So good. Void of power and prayer. A lot of times they find that. I'm not saying all the time. You guys are probably the core, so I get that. Um, but I want them to know that there's power in prayer. That when we pray, something happens. Yeah. Apathetic to the kingdom of God. And I had to look up apathetic and anemic, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> showing little or no interest or concern at all. And that's what statistics show. 95% have never got anybody saved. 70% never invite anybody to church. And this, I'll say this, if you're embarrassed of your church, find another church that you can invite people to, if that's the issue. If you feel that it's just not right to invite people, go to a church that you can do that. Because you know what? We need church inviting machines. I still believe the church is how the loss is going to be won. So the challenge would be, if Sunday we were packed with 104 people, besides me doing the happy dance, uh, something like that, I believe God has a purpose to pour into their life. So the challenge for that, for you guys, is invite somebody. And do you realize statistically, uh, and those people, I could give you the reports, it takes 18 times to invite someone for them to come. Now, I feel that we're just, we're basically whittling them down. I mean, after 18 times, they're finally saying, for the love, I will go with you. I will go with you. Well, good. That's fine. Because I've found out that no's only no for now. And what that means is something may happen in their life, and you ask them the 17th time to say, listen, my life's falling apart. I'd like to go with you. Awesome. <laughs> And I started with saying this, when, when non-believers come into the church, they often find this, void of power and promises of God. Void of power and promises. Lacking dedication to the Great Commission. Not always, but often. The church's direction or our direction is determined by personal desires, wants, or cultural needs. Yay. We're all cheering. I love it. But... I'm going to end on, well, thank you. Whether it's good or not, it's accurate. And whether all my parts uh, hit home with you, my hope is that from the book of Jude, there was such a strong warning, and it's, it's, it applies today. And every one of you know the word. You could, man, you could be just a force for the kingdom, not saying that you're not now. But I would ask the question, how do you like your drink? You have no idea where I'm going with that. So I'm going to be talking about a wealthy community. They're self-sufficient. So good. They're focused on human, humanitarian events. Man, they love a cause. Man, they'll get involved in it. If it's babies, they'll work babies. Tell you what, if it's the homeless, we'll find shelter for everybody. They were all about humanitarian events. Uh, <laughs> they're written about in the Bible. Uh, and this is in Revelations 3, 15 through 17. We actually had the fun, fun laugh back there. But this is about the church of Laodicea that's written. And this is about the seven churches of Asia Minor. Let me read this to you. This is uh, Revelation 3, 15 through 17. And I know you've heard this. 
And this is out of the NLT. It says, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth, you say. I am rich. And you say, you'll say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and you're miserable, you're poor, and you're blind, and you're naked. But here's what's really cool when you study this out. So, uh, C and I back there in the back were talking, that out of the, uh, if there was a book written about the seven churches of Asia Maya in Revelation, and all of a sudden it's a bestseller, and all of a sudden the town of Laodicea says, did you know we're in that book? And everybody reads it, well, I haven't read it yet. He goes, go read the book. And he goes, dude, we're the only church that got rebuked out of all the other churches. It's kind of ridiculous. And, uh, but where he came from the hot and cold is that the, uh, the church of Laodicea didn't have any way to get water in their own location. So they had two sister cities right next to them. And uh, those two sister cities, one gave them hot water and the other gave them cold water because one of the cities had hot springs. So they built aqueducts and they would shoot the water from city to city. So if you were shooting hot water and it had to travel a pretty good distance, when it got to Laodicea, what was it? It was lukewarm. So, and then they had cold on the other side that was drinking water and they would shoot it down the other aqueduct. And by the time it got there, the cold water was what? It was such a practical analogy. Can I encourage you about when you tell people about the word, tell your story. Man, you don't have to quote scripture. Many people already know it. Tell your story. So it's interesting how in the book of Revelation, they took something so practical that people said, yeah, we drink this water all the time. It's lukewarm. So, and the other challenge with lukewarm water, if it wasn't hot or it wasn't extremely cold, it had bacteria in it. So you didn't want to drink it. And uh, so there was even that situation. So he's talking about, I would rather you be hot or I'd rather you be cold. But I'd rather you not be lukewarm. Can I tell you for me what lukewarm is? The believer that's been a believer for a long time that knows the word that is of no value to the kingdom. Lukewarm. He says, if you're hot, be hot. If you're cold, be cold. But I'd rather you not be lukewarm. And what does he say the response is if you're lukewarm? I'm going to spit you out. I thought, that's pretty vivid when it comes to that. I would not want to be the church. After he wrote the book of Revelation, I would not have a t-shirt on the back saying, uh, but Josh, Josh said something really funny. He said, but they could say on the back of the shirt that God rebukes who he loves. You know, you put that on the back. Yeah, we were the church's rebuke, but he did it because he loves us. <laughs> we all have a view of ourselves. Can I ask you a question? Are you hot, cold, or lukewarm? And can I tell you, I, I know about for me, there's days that I'm hot one moment. I feel really cold. And there's some days I just don't care. <laughs> That's just reality. You know, what's going on in your life? Sorry about that. Uh, that's terrible. And uh, no, it's never with anybody I meet with. No, I'd never say that. But that's reality. So let me, more importantly, what is Jesus' view of are you hot, lukewarm, or cold? Now, I didn't want you to leave. I don't want you to go to dinner and go, I just got my butt kicked. It was terrible. I got my butt kicked. How was your sermon today? Well, I lost 10 pounds. It was, uh, I lost my whole backside. It was terrible. <laughs> That's not what it's about. But Jude is talking about um, just some powerful things here. Yeah. He really is. And uh, I got plenty more, but I want to I end with this. Because this is where next week it's going to get really cool. Check this out. Uh, we're not going to do 14 and 15, but we are going to start with 16. Listen to this. How can you predict an apostate? Check this out. I'm just going to read this. You guys can study this. Verse 16. These are gamblers and complainers. I mean, grumblers, not gamblers. 
<laughs> wow, that just, and he'll say, you're an apostate. You didn't do it. Anyway, these are grumblers and complainers walking according to their own lust. Now, that's not talking about a sensual lust. We'll go into that. And their mouth, great swells, swelling words, flatter people to gain advantage. But listen to this. Listen to seven. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be walkers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. Uh, these are sensual people who cause division, not having the spirit. And I'm just going to read the rest of it. Listen, because it gets really good. Verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So he's giving you how to maintain a godly life, even in the midst of those circumstances. It says, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and on the same have compassion making a distinction. So even though these people are a jagged stone, a reef, and they're wreaking havoc in your church, what are we supposed to do? But he says, on some having compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, uh, hating even the garments defiled by flesh. So here, when you find someone that's an apostate, and we'll get all this, that they have wavered away from their true doctrine, you pull them out of the fire, and you teach them the true word again. Am I to mark them and shun them? After a season of time, if they don't listen to godly counsel. But I look at someone, and if they're teaching wrong doctrine, at least they're teaching something. Man, you're a little off there, but uh, I'll pull you back out of the fire. I will speak love to you. Uh, so we're going to go through just one more week with Jude. And the challenge this week is just think of where is my walk with the Lord? You know what? With the amount of people we have in here, let's just say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 18. 18 people, if you invited two families and they came, we'd be packed. I'm not trying to grow the church. I don't want you to think that I'm trying to do that. I'm not trying to get a bigger tithing uh, deposit. That's not what I'm doing. But I would like to know that the harvest fields are ripe. And the only way that I know, I can only reach a certain amount of people. But if you'll reach them with me and you come in, I'll make a promise to you. I won't embarrass you. I'll preach the word and we'll give them an opportunity for salvation. And, uh, and then we'll bring them into the community and love on them. So let's go over there today. Father, we just thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that I believe I brought what you've asked me to bring. And Father, that hearts were open. And then, Father, they heard the, uh, the essence of my heart. Father, we pray over the word right now that uh, uh, we recognize uh, proper teaching. Father, I thank you that Jude has brought to light some of the concerns in your heart. And, Father, they're concerns for us. But, Father, I pray right now that the word is alive. When we read it this week, that, Father, it's going to jump out on the page. It's going to speak directly to us. When we pray, the Holy Spirit. It's going to speak to our spirit and answers are going to be brought forth of things we've been believing for. Father, when we pray, bodies are going to be mended. Father, we thank you for that. Organs will be renewed, remade, whatever needs to happen. Father, the power of the word of God is never left. But Father, we're going to seize it this week. And Father, we're going to believe it by faith that when we pray it out, it'll affect a change in anything that we speak because it's a promise of God. Thank you, Father. And Lord, I pray right now that people are coming from the north, south, east, and west. That, Father, they're coming to have an encounter with you. And that, Father, as they come, Father, we will love them. Father, we will pour the word into them. We'll speak life and hope into them. And, Father, that the kingdom will be grown and they'll see goodness. And the result is they'll fall in love with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a whopping good Sunday. It's a good Sunday. And uh, so next week we're going to do the last of Jude. And my hope is that you guys will know Jude. We hope this message is exactly what you needed. If you'd like to bless this ministry, you can do so online at generationchurchme.com. If you'd like more content from Generation Church, you can do so by following us on social media. We also want you to know that you are welcomed and you are loved. Thank you. Have a great day.